Thank you for taking your relationship with Jesus seriously. Coming to church isn't just an activity that we do, but a people that we are. Yes. That's right. Yeah, I got my set stuff set up here. I probably should have did this before I got up here. I can't find my other Bible, so I got to use my phone. But it's okay. Um, something I don't know if you've ever discovered this feature. If you've got a smartphone, but on your smartphone, there's a little thing. There's a note area where you can put stuff. I always advise people to do that. You know, maybe I might say something you might not quite understand. Take note of that, or maybe you don't quite see eye to eye on. Take note of that. Go back. Go to scripture. Look at this. Don't just take my word for things. Um, really, in 40 minutes of talking, I mean, you can't understand everything. You know what I mean? I, I have to take notes. It's really what helps me grow. Because um, it's real easy to, be, to let church become um, an activity that we do, a tradition that we do on Sunday mornings. We come in, we get our snacks. Based off how well of a job I do, you walk away based off how you feel I did. It becomes a movie theater experience, I call it. You know, don't give me that power. I'm not a good actor. I'll disappoint you, I promise. But no, we are saints being equipped for the work of ministry. We are soldiers for the kingdom of Christ, all right? It's important to see ourselves this way. So if you would, if you have a Bible, open it up to Matthew chapter 7, or your phone, however you get there. I'm going to be in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 through 23. Now there's a lot of scripture here I got to go through. Um, so I'm just going to read. I read out of the Holman Christian Standard Bible. You can read whatever you want. So Matthew 7, 13. There might actually even be a subtitle in your Bible that says entering the kingdom. And what was neat was, is, um, the Lord was developing this word. He was showing me some stuff um, one day when I was reading my Bible. And I kind of was thinking about it a lot all through the last week. And then when I sat and listened to Mike's sermon last Sunday, um, it was like, oh, okay. It was just like a clear indication that this is what you're supposed to talk about today. Because I knew I was going to be preaching this Sunday. Um, I love how God does that stuff when he starts fitting stuff together. But Anyways, I'm just going to go ahead and read 7.13. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who go through it. How narrow is the gate and difficult the road that leads to life, and few find it. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravaging wolves. You'll recognize them by their fruit. Are, gabes, are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree produces good fruit but a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, neither can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that doesn't produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire, so you'll recognize them by their fruit. Not everyone who comes to me and says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. And on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name, and many miracles in your name? Then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. All right. Lot, lot there. So, but the reason I read all of it, because it's so important to always, always, always read scripture in context. I cannot stress that enough. There's a lot of pastors and teachers out there that pull certain Bible verses out of the Bible to fit their agenda, and they throw it in there, and it sounds biblical, but it's not truth because it wasn't delivered in context. So, to make sure we're in context, I'm actually going to be bouncing between Matthew chapter 7 and Matthew chapter 3. So if I get you turning back and forth, back and forth, it's for a specific reason. Because they actually kind of come together. So, where we're at in scripture here in Matthew 7, Jesus is just wrapping up his famous Sermon on the Mount. You know, you might be familiar with it. Um, he begins it in Matthew chapter 5, you know, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for they shall inherit the kingdom of God. There's a whole bunch of information. It's three chapters long. Great stuff. It would be an honor to preach the whole Sermon on the Mount, but we would be here for about a year. Because there's so much rich spiritual food inside there. So starting in the beginning, Jesus here is using... The word broad path and narrow path. So broad, remember, many, 
narrow path, few, a good way to remember this is, well, you need a broad path for many to go down it, right? I mean, so in only a narrow path, only a few can go down it. Um, but when I, when I think about broad path, for some reason, I always think about roads. So I, I think about Interstate 80. We're from the Midwest. We all know 80. Um, lots of traffic, very fast drivers. They're all on there playing on their phones and rock music and smoking and drinking and who knows what people do in their cars nowadays. But anyways, Jesus says they're heading to the end of their destruction. I'm not saying if you smoke, you're going on the path of destruction. That's not what I mean. I'm just, I don't know what I mean by that. But they're on Interstate 80 heading all one way to an end, Jesus is saying here. But narrow is the path that few find. So, I don't know if any of you guys remember, remember Middle Road exit off of 80, way before the Betplex and all that was there? That, that exit has been there forever. But before the Betplex and stuff like that, it was all cornfields. You wouldn't have known it was there. Nobody took that exit. And I kind of think of the narrow path being that because it's a, it's a very skinny exit that comes off a very large one and few go down it. Now, the Betplex is there, many go that way, but back in the day, you didn't. It's a one-way exit, you get it? Jesus is the way. There's only one way. You have to go down that way. So, why is it difficult, though? Why does Jesus here say, it's difficult? Well, because it's so much easier to live to the flesh. It's easy to blend in with people on the broad path because many are on it. It's easy to just follow the crowd, John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus talking to Nicodemus says, one must be born again to even see the kingdom. God needs to help open up our eyes in order to even see that narrow path because we'll become so blinding. So when Scripture talks about being born again, uh, dying of the self, uh, taking off our flesh, they kind of all mean the same thing. It's denying ourselves. That's why Jesus says, in order to follow me, you must first deny yourself because if we don't, we don't make it about him, we'll make it about us, right? Walk by the flesh, walk by the spirit. Two different things. Our old, our old life and our old way need to come to an end and a new life begins in him. We're moving in a different direction. We're on the one way. Mike teaches all the time. The word repentance means metanoia, the Greek word metanoia. Meta means change, noia means the mind. We, begin, we, we quit walking the way we want to, and we walk by the Spirit, we live by the Spirit. By continuing, though, that life of repentance, we get into like what Romans chapter 12, 2 talks about, the transforming, the renewal of the mind. We kind of touched on that a little bit in Coffee Talk. Um, but it's good stuff, you know. So, real quick, we're going to jump back a few chapters to Matthew chapter 3. Um, actually, I'm just going to start at the beginning. So, in those days, John the Baptist came. He was preaching in the wilderness of Judea. and He was saying, repent because the kingdom of heaven has come near. So this is what Mike was talking about last week. If you didn't get an opportunity to see it, I would encourage you to go back, watch Mike's sermon last week. It was really good. Um, but anyways, continue in verse 3. He says, for he was one who spoke through the prophet Isaiah, who said, a voice of one crying out of the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John himself had camel hair garment and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Yum. Then people from Jerusalem and all of Judea and all the vicinity of the Jordan were flocking to him, and they were baptizing by him in the Jordan, of the, the Jordan River, and they were confessing their sins. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come into the place of his baptism, he said to them, Broad of vipers, you were warned to flee from the wrath coming. Therefore, produce fruit consistent with repentance. And don't presume to say to yourselves, Well, we have Abraham as our father, for I tell you that God is able to raise up children from Abraham from these stones. Even now the axe is ready to strike the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that doesn't produce good, good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Okay, a lot to go through there. So again, Mike was touching on this a little bit last week. Um, looking at verse 2, it says, Repent for the kingdom of God is, is near. Other versions say, Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. They mean the same thing. But Jesus actually here says something later in Scripture that's really good. He said, There was no greater man than John the Baptist. Okay? 
None of us know John the Baptist, only what we read. But we know Mike Harmon. So imagine Jesus said, Mike Harmon, there's no greater man than he, right? How does that feel? You're married to the greatest man alive. Okay. But no, seriously. So if Jesus said that there was no greater man than this, I mean, you would listen to that guy, right? I mean, he's the example. This dude knows what he's talking about. And that's exactly what John here is dealing with. And then he gets into some Pharisee and some Jewish tradition stuff that I'm not going to get all into that. that that's a whole different lesson. But he does, he does touch on some really good points, like in verse 8, therefore produce fruit consistent with repentance. And um, he jumps down. Uh, he gets into the fruit stuff. You know, even now the axe is ready to strike the root of the trees um, for those that don't produce fruit. And we're going to get into a little bit of that. But what I want to do is turn the page of your Bible over to Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. Um, Matthew chapter 4, Jesus goes out, and he's led by the Spirit, goes into the wilderness, um, is, t- is uh, fast for 40 days, is tempted by the tempter. And then after that, he kind of goes into ministry. And in verse 17 of Matthew chapter 4, Jesus here began to preach, repent because the kingdom of heaven has come near. Well, that's interesting. We just read that a chapter earlier. I wonder if there's something to this. Okay, so when God says something once, good. Now, God says something twice, pay attention, okay? There's something to this. But, and I don't mean this to condemn people, but the American Christian church, we got like two Bible verses we cling to, right? John 3.16, Ephesians 2.8. The rest of God, it's just rubbish. We don't need to take his word seriously. Listen, if repentance was a suggestion from God, he wouldn't have talked about it as much as he does in Scripture. Jesus wouldn't have preached it. It's actually the first thing recorded from him when he begins, after he gets, um, when he's baptized, he goes out into the wilderness, and here he goes. So it's where it begins. Um, Again, because if we don't make it about him, he'll make it about us. We can't serve two masters. You'll love one and hate the other. Cannot be a friend of the world and be an enemy enemy of God. So, forgive me. We've got to turn back to Matthew chapter 7. Go back to our context. I know. So much turn in pages. That's why I like my YouVersion Bible app. Okay. So back to 14. Matthew 7, 14, how narrow is the gate and difficult the road that leads to life if you find it. So there's actually another Bible verse later. Jesus uh, touches on, it's, it's pretty similar. If we try to hang on to our life, we'll lose it. But if we lose it for his sake, we'll find it. And then moving right along, um, this false prophet thing that's next. So um, false prophet is... Well, it is what it is. It's false. But so because churches can get legalistic and even in our Christian minds, we can get there. Let's say you were to come over to my house, right, Greg? You're going to come over and you're going to help me with a project. And I don't know, we're building something and a paint can rolls off a shelf and it hits me in the foot. Okay. I don't know about you, but that would really hurt. And so I just throw out about 30 F-bombs. You know, I just become super unchristian. I knock over some tables, say a bunch of things. I'm not proud of, does that make me a false prophet? You get in a legalistic enough church, they might. might say you're a false prophet. What about... Okay. So, a little over a year ago, I had a situation with some brothers of mine. Something I seen that was biblical, even. And I addressed it with them. And so what ended up happening is it didn't get handled the way that I thought it should have. I know. And um, I got mad, said some things I shouldn't have. And um, it created some stress in my friends' lives and maybe, maybe even damaged our relationships a little bit because I immaturely handled the situation I probably should have handled a little bit better. Not one of my proud moments as a Christian. Does that make me a false prophet? Would, would, you, would you say that? No, a false prophet is somebody who's actually designed for deception and deceiving. Great examples of these are 
people that are mediums, um, psychics, something like that, they can actually have a little bit of truth, like horoscope type stuff. There can be some truth in there, but it's designed to deceive you. If it's pulling you away from Christ, be careful. If it's pulling you away from that, it can be damaging. So, the best way to overcome deception and lies is to know truth, right? Truth is what helps us with that. I always like that story. Um, when people study, the, and you've probably heard this example before, but people who um, work in the U.S. Department of Treasury with, when it comes to dollar bills and stuff, how they, how they study counterfeits is they don't study all the different counterfeits out there so when they see it, they know it. They study the real thing so much that when a counterfeit comes, they're like, no, no, no way, that's, that's, that's counterfeit. Because they know the, the real thing so well. And that's what Jesus here is elaborating on. He says, look, you'll know them by their fruit. Not his, theirs. Because grapes aren't gathered from, from thorn bushes or figs from thistles. There is the, is the key word there. Biblical fruit is probably one of the best things. We talked about it a little bit Friday night, Carol. Love biblical fruit because the Bible talks about fruit all over. You know, even the beginning with Adam and Eve, you know, go and be fruitful in all you do. And so um, a tree is known by its fruit. A better way of putting it, you know, you wouldn't go out in your yard and look at your acorn tree and just get furious. There's no apples on it. I mean, that's stupid. Or you go in your backyard and be like, look, my acorn tree... I don't know why there's no pears on there. I keep coming outside to get some fruit off this acorn tree. That's silly. And that's kind of what he's saying. So you'll recognize a ravenous wolf pretending to be a sheep by their fruit. You know, Satan came, speaking of Adam and Eve, so Satan came and began to work on Eve to get her to see that the tree in the middle of the garden, the one God said, hey, you can eat of anything, but don't touch this one. He began to work on her. She began to see that that tree was good for eating. And, and that's what he did. He used, he used, you know, did God really say, you know, so um, he deceived her away from that, you know. Um, other false prophets, can, they can begin to, to, to declare, you know, maybe they've got some kind of special connection with God. Um, that's why I use the mediums and the horoscopes. They might have some kind of gift of prophecy, and be able to see into the future, and that's what pulls people away. So, because we're dealing with fruit here, I just want to, I love that you, we sang that song, Abide. I love that song. So I'm going to go to actually John 15, because John 15 is all about fruit, and it talks about the real deal fruit. So if you want to turn there, you can. Otherwise, I'm just going to read real quick. All right. Whoop, not Matthew 15, John 15. Because I'm a context person, I don't like pulling just specific verses out. I'm going to read the whole thing. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vineyard keeper. Every branch in me that does not produce fruit, he removes. He prunes every branch that produces fruit so that it will produce more fruit. You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me, or abide in me, and I in you, just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself. Unless it remains on the vine, so neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit because you can do nothing without me. If anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown aside like a branch and he withers. They gather them up and they throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you produce much fruit, proved to be, proving to be my disciples. So, there's a lot of stuff in there about fruit. But basically, to sum it up, Jesus is saying, my fruit lasts. Apart from me, you can accomplish nothing. All right? The only way to be fruitful is to remain in Christ. You can go into the world and be fruity, but that's different. Okay, That's weird. Don't be like that. But like trees that have roots, if we're not attached to Jesus, the root can become evil, corrupt. It can become about ourselves. And James talks a lot about that. But I know at a certain stage in my life, I would become frustrated over certain things. Like I would try to do things. I would try to 
I don't know. I would find myself saying these things like, you know what, it doesn't seem like no matter what I do, it never turns out good. It's, it's, I should just quit. You know, nobody really likes me anyways. I don't even know why I try. You know what I'm saying? Like, and I get myself in these really stuck seasons and really what it was is in my flesh, I don't have the ability to produce the righteousness of God. I absolutely in my flesh can't. It's because the root was bad. It was all about me. I can't, I can't do something and then expect you to behave a certain manner. That's me playing God. That's not, that's not abiding in him and allowing his fruit to come out. And it, it becomes down to expectations. We're just selfish, self-centered people. We talked about that a little bit too in Coffee Talk. Broad path, okay? So, I'm going to do a little bit more flip-flop. And again, I know, forgive me, I don't, I, I don't like flipping my Bible a whole bunch when people are preaching either, but I have to. So, you go back to, we're going back to Matthew 3. We're going to go from Matthew 3 to Matthew 7. Just, they're just a few pages away in your Bibles. Matthew 3.10. That's what he was saying. He said, even now the axe is ready to strike the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that doesn't produce good fruit will get cut down and thrown into the fire. That's why I talked about the root of it. But when we read in Matthew chapter 7, we're going to go back there. I don't think we'll go back to Matthew 3, so... Matthew 7, 9, Jesus here, every tree that doesn't produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Okay. Did, I, we just read that. Again, when God shows things twice, he actually said it, we read it three times if you were paying attention. Matthew 15 said the same thing. Why am I elaborating this fruit thing? Because I think a lot of average Christians don't understand why we're here. They don't understand their purpose. What is my will, forgive me, what is his will for my life? Write this down. Hang this up on your mirror. Put it on your fridge. Somewhere where you can see it. God's will for my life is to bring the Father glory. It's that simple. It's what Jesus was all about. It's what we need to be all about. But maybe your thought is after reading something like that, you know, if, so if I'm not producing good fruit, then I'm going to get thrown into the fire, so I better start producing fruit, right? I mean, I need to do that because I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to go to eternal damnation. So, man, I, I better start producing fruit. Here's the cool part. You can't. Hate to be the bearer of bad news, but Jesus clearly said in Matthew 15, apart from me, you can do nothing. And it's the easiest Yet, hardest part of Christianity is abiding in Christ. Remain in me, and I in you, and you will bear much fruit. So, we talked about it, and I'm glad you talked about it, Angie. Thank you for that lesson today, and thank you for doing that. Is how do we do that? How do you abide in Him? So, let me ask you this question today, church. What does your alone time with Jesus look like? I mean, is there any? Because all over, when we look in Scripture, God gives us different cues on how to do that. So if I'm not in the Word, I'm not going to know the will, and therefore I won't be living out my life. I just stay on the broad path. All over, he says, be still and know that I am God. He tells us in other verses to ask, and it'll be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be open for you. Draw near towards me and I'll draw near towards to you. God says, you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. It's always intentional. I'm not trying to get into this workspace type thing, but we won't accidentally find ourselves on our knees spending time with Christ, right? It's always intentional. It's always intentional. We'll never do this on accident. And so alone time with him is really what he wants. And I promise you, he so wants that for you. That's his greatest heart. Just come to me all who are heavy laden and I will give you rest, you know. And I love that about him. His, his 
His heart for us is just so pure and genuine. I no longer call you slaves, but friend. Love that verse as well. And what's cool about fruit is I listen to a lot of a lot of different Bible teachers. I listen to a lot of ones that I don't actually agree with. I feel like I grow through that for some reason. Challenges what I really believe, and I like to get into Scripture and just kind of tear it apart. Not to prove them wrong, but it, it does. It helps me grow. But one teacher, and you might be familiar with this guy, that I do really enjoy listening to is Francis Chan. I really like the guy. I, I think he's biblically sound. Um, I don't know Francis personally, um, but I, I've listened to enough of his stuff. I've read some of his books. Um, I know he loves the Lord. But if you biblically break down some of the stuff he talks about, like a lot of it, um, and no disrespect to him, I doubt he'd ever watch this video, but if we do and I get it wrong, you can call me Francis and we can talk about it. Um, <laughs> he, uh, his, his stuff that he presents really isn't all that biblically revolutionary. You know what I mean? Like, it's all whatever. But I think what really makes him a good pastor or a good teacher is I know he's got to have an alone time with Christ. When he preaches, he has an anointing behind him when he stands up where, where he gets in front and the Lord can go before him and start working out here on people's hearts. And so when his words come out, have a way of manifesting the Holy Spirit. Transformation starts to begin. People leave. Fruit starts happening. The Father's glorified. Amen. So that's what makes good teachers and pastors are people that spend time with Christ because of that anointing and whatever. And that's a really good reason why you need to be here in the church. Because you, if you miss worship and you miss this, it, it's you can watch it on TV, and no disrespect if you have to. I know people have medical conditions and they have to stay home, but it's really what helps us when you're in person, you know, to not be forsaking the assembly, as some are in a habit of doing. It's hard to get that at home. So real relationships with Jesus bear fruit. And what's interesting about this is when we look out into the world, Especially nowadays, it's, it's changed so much, even from when I was a child. You know, we've got, um, and I don't mean this in a condemning way, but, you know, we've got boys wanting to be girls, girls wanting to be boys. Some kids want to be pets, and that's weird. But you know what? I think God looks at his people and goes, man, they identify with me but they look just like the people on the broad path. That's weird. At least the furries, that's what they're called, Mary. The people that want to be animals, that's a real thing. They meow and they bite and they, get, they wear costumes. At least they play the part. They look like what they believe, right? The word Christian means Christ-like. Something we have to take serious. And I know this is a little bit tougher of a lesson. Forgive me for that. Because we're going to get into some really tough scripture. And I'm going to be really transparent. When the Lord gave me this Bible verse last week, I went, mm -mm. no, I don't want to preach on that one. But I have to be obedient to what the Lord leads me to. Because I'm believing today, somebody's going to come off that broad path. That somebody's going to come into the kingdom. But there's going to be more joy today in heaven when one sinner repents, then when a hundred righteous people are like, yep, I'm good. good. So, Jesus is always moving. So, we're still in Matthew chapter 7, 21. This is probably the toughest part of Scripture in all of the Bible, I believe. There's no harder verses than these. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. And I'll be honest, when I used to read that verse, it used to scare me. It scared me. And still, I think even as a normal Christian, when you read that verse, it kind of hits you a little, you know what I'm saying? I can't, can't imagine standing before the Lord. I just can't imagine that. Him say, yeah, I didn't know you, you know? And I'm not trying to produce fear out here, and I'm going to get you to bow your heads and raise your hands. And I, I'm not into that. That's not my, that's, I'm not doing that to try to 
fear people into this. I'm just using Jesus' words here out of Scripture and what he's saying. But what's interesting in this verse is he does something interesting. He says, Lord, Lord. He uses the word twice. And I mean, I went back and studied it in Greek, and it's the word kurios, and it's the same word twice. And then I, I began to dig a little bit deeper, and there was this guy who had his master's in some seminary class. He wrote this the thesis on basically this whole thing. The dude was way too smart for his own good. I didn't understand his point. I read it, and I'm like, it was so... But I did, I did read some other stuff out there. And the conclusion, after praying and asking the Lord, what, what are you saying here? Is This is my opinion. Could be right, could be wrong. And that's why I'm going to say it's my opinion. So when we look at the book of Philippians, the book of Philippians says that every knee will bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen? So we know that. So now there's this identity process to it. He's saying, Lord, Lord. Like, you knew about me, so now you're, you're, you're calling upon my name. So not everyone who says that will enter in, but only the one who does the will of my Father. But Jesus uses this again when you go into Scripture. There's other parts in Scripture where he uses the same exact word, Lord, Lord. He says, you call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do what I say. That's, that's very hypocritical, you know. If we look at the word kurios, the word Lord means master, all authoritative, whatever. And I believe the reason, he's not saying like, hey, you didn't know about me. He's saying, you never, I never knew you. We never repented. We never entered the kingdom. We just stayed on Interstate 80, cruising right along. Never became what he created us for. And so when we get down to verse 22... He says, but Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name, and do miracles in your name? And he will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. So um, I remember a couple years back, there's this guy I used to watch on YouTube. Um, he, he's, really, he's a really good, uh, famous pastor. I'm not going to use his name. And I watched him teach this lesson, and he taught it that, that, that who Jesus here is talking to, he's talking to the false prophet. You know, because they had the ability to, to, to prophesy and do these things in his name. And he's going to say, because you are an evildoer, depart from me. And you could read it that way. But the reason I read this, this whole thing in context is for that reason. I don't see it that way. Because we have to remember when we came into the beginning of it, we began on the broad path, narrow path. And the key word in this is many. Broad path, many. Narrow path, few. And Jesus begins with that. Many will come to me on that day. So, I know people become confused a little bit with this decision-making process of Christianity, you know, and, and um, deciding to follow Jesus is a beginning. It's a great beginning, and I'm not condemning it. But in the month of January, when you look out into the business world, in the month of January alone, gym memberships sometimes exceed sales over 50 or 40% in one month rather than any other month out of the year. Why would you guess that? New Year's resolution. New Year's resolution. Yeah. People are making decisions. Okay? Great decision. I'm not knocking that decision. But does that decision in itself create the transformation that that person's trying to get? No. Great decision, though. I mean, you can even purchase the, you can even purchase the gym membership. I mean, you can, you can go show up every day, and it will never transform you. But we have to apply this. My wife, Angela, on September 4th, 2015, stood before God and men. Some of you guys were there. And... We've decided to get married. Does that mean I have a life-giving marriage today because of that decision? Great decision. I love that decision. But we made vows even, I'd call them. But we have to be very careful that a relationship with Jesus isn't just a once-and-done decision. It's an ongoing process. That's why it's called a relationship. 
Um, I, I like to think of it as, uh, as like a cookbook. You can't read a cookbook and fill your stomach, okay? The, the Bible's like that. I mean, you could sit there and even memorize that cookbook. It doesn't mean that we know how to cook, though. We've got to read it, apply it, digest it. The information then becomes transformation, and trans- transformation is what bears fruit. It's glorifying to God. That is our purpose here on earth. Ask and it'll be given to you. Seek and you should find. Knock on the door and it'll be open for you. I just want to remind you today. I just want to remind you, God's not a liar. Thank you. He's not a liar. He wouldn't invite us to it if he was going to go, I can't believe you bought that. Looking at me sitting there. He's wanting to come find me. I'm just going to, eh, I don't believe you yet. I mean, I believe sometimes we, you know, we do need to keep applying ourselves. And, and I love to, last time I preached, I, I, I like to challenge people five minutes to Jesus. Five minutes. Go in your bedroom, shut the door, give them five minutes. Turn your phone off, turn the TV off, turn the radio off, shut it all down. Five minutes with them. I'm telling you, it's the hardest five minutes you'll ever have. If you're not in the habit of doing that, it'll be very awkward and weird. But it's what separates broad path from narrow path. Again, easy concept, very hard to do. Easy, hard. But if knowing Jesus, if knowing Jesus through faith is what decides eternity at stake, this would be something I would pay attention to and stop wasting it on stupid fleshly stuff. I do too. I'm not condemning, man. I waste a lot of stupid time. But what's great about every day is God's allowed us to sleep last night. We've woken up today. He's resetted our mind and woke us up to a new day for a new opportunity for a new purpose, purpose. See sleep like that. See it. Is God just giving you an ability to forget it all? You get to wake up new. If you let it, you can drag yesterday into today. You can do that, but you don't have to. I know there's probably some great scientific reason as to why you need sleep and these neurons and all this. No, God's created it for a reason. So today, maybe you've been in the fast lane for a really long time. You're on 80, doing 80. You turned your blinker on a long time ago, but you've not veered over yet. We allow, sometimes allow fun to come over faith, happiness over holiness. We let other things take place of knowing an all-holy God. He paid a penalty we could never pay. He made a way for us and was crucified and was raised on the third day. Never get tired of hearing the gospel. It's called the good news for a reason. The Lord invites us many times to himself. He commands us to follow him. He says, come after me. And I know today these are a little bit tougher words from him. Forgive me for that. But real quick, I just want to finish chapter 7 out because it fits right in. His, his sermon always fits together. So right here, he just continues on in Matthew chapter 7, 24. He says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a sensible man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the rivers rose, and the winds blew and pounded that house. Yet it didn't collapse because its foundation was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't act on them will be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the rivers rose, the winds blew and pounded that house. It collapsed, and that collapse was great. The storms come. Jesus warns us. He promises us. In this world, you'll have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. There's safety, and there's a firm foundation, the cornerstone, our Lord Jesus Christ. Um... So we have communion to do today. You don't have to be a member here. You don't have to have um, done so many hours in any other thing. If you call Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, you're invited to this. 
Um, but before we go into communion, you know, we should always be examining ourselves. I like how Mike teaches. We should be doing that on a daily basis. This shouldn't just be something we do every time we do communion. But, you know, examine, is there, is there something I have against one of my brothers or sisters in Christ? Is there something, some forgiveness in some area I've, I've not dealt with? Maybe, maybe it's some of this stuff we talked today. You know, maybe I've been calling you Lord by name only, but not relationship. I don't know. But take that, take that time and, you know, take a minute and, and do that. And then once you're done, go ahead and, and grab the elements and sit down. And um, if it's cool, we can do it together. That'd be nice.